Welcome back to iGen Politics. This is a podcast that makes politics engaging and relevant for all generations. This is Victor Xi. And I'm Jill Wine-Banks. And today I'm wearing a Statue of Liberty in the hopes that it will continue to protect our democracy. It's, so it's really hard to keep track of all of the investigations into Donald Trump. Uh, there are ones at the Department of Justice for January 6th in its broadest sense, and Mar-a-Lago, which is where uh, our guest is calling in from, uh, New York civil and criminal cases, Georgia, the January 6th committee, Eugene Carroll, uh, cases at the Supreme Court, and who knows what else uh, there will be and what's to come. So a lot of our audience is probably wondering, how does Donald Trump's potential running for office, something that may or may not be announced while we talk, uh, impact possible indictments of him? And what are Republicans thinking about Trump after uh, the poor showing of his candidates uh, last Tuesday? And we're going to explore all of this with today's guest, an outstanding reporter who has covered all of these topics Hugo Lowell is a political enterprise reporter, and we're going to find out what a political enterprise reporter is, because neither Victor or I knows that. So Hugo, that'll be one of our questions. Um, he works for The Guardian, and you probably have seen many of his groundbreaking, explosive, breaking news scoops. So welcome, Hugo. We're really excited to have you with us today. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's cool. Of course. So before we get into all the investigations into Trump, um, you know, I know you um, pretty well. Let's begin by maybe getting to know you a little bit better for our audience. Um, you're covering U.S. politics, obviously, but you're a British and you work for a venerable British publication, The Guardian. Um, where were you born? I was born in uh, New York, actually. Um, it's my little party trick when people are like, where are you from? And I say New York and they're like, well, um, but, uh, no, I went to school in New York. Uh, I actually went to the Dalton school. Um, and then before I finished high school, uh, kind of my family moved to the UK and I went to university in the UK. Uh, and so I kind of, I feel like I bridge, uh, the U S and the UK in that sense. And, um, you know, obviously, obviously right from the, the guardian, but covering Trump and the, the department and now the department of justice. So you went to school in both the U S and in Britain. Uh, I assume, because you must have continued with schooling after you left the U.S. Uh, yeah, yeah. So I uh, like to think uh, I have exposure to both educational systems. And um, I don't know if that's a good thing. I guess it's a good, maybe it's a good thing. Well, it also probably helped you to learn about the U.S. government and our politics, um, because otherwise it might have been pretty tricky. And I understand that you actually haven't completed or haven't had your graduation ceremony anyway, uh, and that you actually were supposed to be graduating now, but because of Donald Trump's announcement that he was going to announce something big, you weren't able to go to your graduation. Is that true? Uh, yeah, I mean, more or less. I mean, um, it was a delayed graduation because of kind of COVID, so they decided to hold it in November. Um, it was it was actually around, yeah, it was around the time of the, the midterms, uh, a couple of days out from election night. And so um, I, I decided that the the midterm elections and they've been pretty historic were probably a better thing to uh, uh, keep track of, especially down from Mar-a-Lago where uh, I think we saw basically what Trump was thinking, kind of the people he was surrounding himself with. And I think that was actually really important as we kind of gear up for uh, presidential mm -hmm. campaign coverage. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm wondering, um, what do kind of people in England think about U.S. politics right now, especially uh, after the midterm election and with all of the investigations into um, Trump? That's a good question. I don't know if uh, I'm particularly well versed to uh, answer that in part because I spend all my time seemingly in West Palm Beach. Um, but um, look, I think Trump knows and I think his aides know that he remains a fixation of national politics in this country, but also kind of around the world. And they are trying to capitalize on his kind of brand and his name recognition. And the fact that, you know, he in many ways remains the front runner uh, for the Republican nomination for 24. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't think that's a point of view that that's, you know, different in the UK or anywhere else in the world. You know, people see Trump and they expect that he's going to run for 20 in 24. Um, and, and that's kind of how things are proceeding. Of course, one of the biggest differences between the UK and the US is that you can quickly get rid of the person who's running your government, as you just did multiple times 
in the last few months. Um, I mean, Liz Truss lasted, what, 42 days or something? It was something A couple like of Scaramucci's. That. Yeah, exactly. So, and we, we can't do that. But I also want to ask you about The Guardian, because I'm not sure that all of our audience will understand exactly what The Guardian is. And I was particularly interested in its founding, which is really a long time ago, but that it has a trust that makes you able to continue to offer independent news, or at least that's your goal, is independent news um, for free. Can you talk more about that? Yeah, look, it's a really unique business model. It's um, the, the Guardian is owned by the Scott Trust, uh, which actually owns Guardian News and Media, which owns the, the Guardian and the Observer right. newspapers. Um, and it's really unique because it makes us, you know, immune to kind of financial pressures or kind of shareholder pressures that maybe other other companies um, or other news organizations might be subject to. Um, and it's a, a pretty proud history in that sense. Uh, and if you think about like kind of like the Guardian's greatest stories, especially in the U.S., like, you know, they've really been about trying to expose government corruption. And you know, most recently, I think almost famously, maybe, you know, you have Snowden and the NSA uh, files that the Guardian want to put it for. Um, and so that's kind of the, the recent history, I guess. But there is certainly a an element uh, and a sense, I think, internally that, you know, we are very committed to reporting on the kind of the levers of government, mm -hmm. especially in Washington, whether it's kind of the Intel community or the Justice Department or Congress and kind of the investigations that, uh, that, that, that happen in Washington. That really is our bread and butter. And I think uh, we've, we've done a very good job in covering both the January 6th committee and also uh, many of the criminal investigations surrounding the former president. I mean, I'll admit that if, if it weren't for you, I probably wouldn't read The Guardian, but I have now become a very loyal Hugo Lowell uh, reader. So you have uh, at least another uh, reader uh, of your stories. I I'm wondering, so you started at The Guardian as their lead congressional correspondent, correct? Yeah, so look, uh, the mandate was to cover congressional leadership. Yeah. Um, it, this was right after January 6th. Uh, you know, Democrats were, you know, were really in power, but there was a lot of focus on, on January 6th and, and kind of trying to find a way to investigate the Capitol attack. And so kind of what happened was while leadership was talking about, you know, sending a potential January 6th commission as it was then before it got killed, um, it became very apparent to me that this was going to be the biggest investigation in town mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and potentially the most consequential investigation that Congress has ever conducted. And so I shifted off the, the House kind of democratic leadership reporting role to cover the, the committee full time. And now I, I guess I've become like a, a Trump investigations reporter in many respects. And I think Joe, that, that might answer your question a little bit, you know, political enterprise is, is like a catch all phrase now for covering both Trump, but also the justice department and all, you know, all, all kind of federal and national security investigations, because those worlds have already started to collide. And if there is ever an instance when the justice department decides to prosecute Trump, then I think the best coverage comes from reporters who have insight into both. That makes sense. And that would also include, I would assume, the New York civil and criminal investigations, the Georgia investigation, et cetera, since they are all kind of related to um, the character that you're reporting on, Donald Trump. Yeah. And, and look, I think this is a challenge that all new organizations face, you know, trying to prioritize resources to cover these investigations because you know as victor said there's so many right i mean you've got the georgia Fulton county investigation you've got the doj's january 6th investigation the doj's mar-a-lago documents investigation the new york investigation into the trump organization uh and kind of the perks that alan weisselberg and kind of other executives right. um receive but then also you know trump org and, and trump inflating the value of assets to, to receive better financial terms and stuff, things like that there's just so many um that you know, I have really decided, and I think the paper writ large has decided to focus on the investigations that I think have real um, criminal significance. And, and that's, I think that's why we have taken a, a particular interest in the documents investigation, January 6th. Um, and, and also one of the New York uh, state AG investigations, the one about um, the inflated assets, because that's now been referred to the Southern District of New York. Although I would say that the ongoing criminal trial and um, other, the AG's investigation could end up destroying the Trump organization completely so that right. they have some 
serious significance, but I want to put it all in the context of the fact that if I have it correctly, you are only 23 years old. And um, we've been on several MSNBC panels together and you are so sophisticated and so knowledgeable. Um, it's, it's sort of surprising to me that you have accomplished all this. You know, you're only what, two years older maybe than, than Victor, uh, who I also consider extremely knowledgeable and sophisticated. But talk about getting into a position like this at the age of 23. Well, that, that's very kind. And, you know, every time we're on together, um, Jill, I just uh, I just listen to you and I just nod and agree. And whatever you say, I'm just like, listen to Jill. So um, th that's that. But look. Um, and you're chivalrous, I, too. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, look, I think I've, I might be 23, but I've also been in journalism for a little bit. It's, um, you know, before I covered Congress uh, and before I covered kind of, you know, now the DOJ, um, I covered the Russian doping scandal for, for a small newspaper in the UK and sports politics and sports corruption, I think was a pretty good training ground in many respects, mm. because um, it's actually harder to report on kind of corruption in, uh, international corruption in sports mm -hmm. than it is, I think kind of institutions and in, let's say Washington, because there is a culture of talking to reporters, you know, covering FIFA, covering the international Olympic committee, um that was really tough because really? there is no culture of talking to reporters um they don't even let you in the building like fifa headquarters reporters stand outside they're hmm. not even let in the building um so then when i kind of ended up in washington when when i effectively came home to the u.s um and started covering congress i was like you know wow this is crazy all this access you know like what's going on um but i think i think it kind of it, it it was a good training ground and it kind of prepared me to deal with um, individuals um, who, who, who might have, you know, their own agendas. And how did you get into journalism? What, what drew you to that as a career? Uh, I'm, I think I'd say I'm an accidental journalist. Um, it really started off covering sports because uh, I swam uh, at a relatively high level, kind of like a national level. Um, and I always thought it was kind of boring to watch sports as a spectator, you know, just in, just in the stands. And I was like, wouldn't it be cool if you like, you know, credential and, you know, could go up to these, you know, athletes who, you know, I really saw as, you know, role models, right? I mean, um, that, you know, all these Olympic athletes who achieve incredible things. And I thought, you know, it'd be really cool to talk to them and you know, kind of um, get access to them and, um, kind of understand what makes them tick. And that's really where it started. I mean, the first event that I covered in terms of, you know, for, for, as a journalist was really um, a FINA World Swimming Championship. Uh, wow. And I kind of covered sports. And that's the progression of going from sports to sports politics when I think, you know, I wanted to cover something more serious and thought, you know, this actually, and this was while I was in high school. So I was like, you know, this beats working at McDonald's. That's really fascinating. What was your event in swimming? Uh, I'm not that tall, so I swam 100 uh, fly and 200 breaststroke. Okay, my Very husband nice. was 50 yard free in college. Oh wow! So. Yeah, you got to be really tall to do the sprint yeah. freestyle. <laughs> yeah, he, he he is. Yeah, all of that blows over my mind because uh, Jill and I, none of us are uh, really in tune to sports. We are much, like you said, uh, as spectators, we don't really tune in. But um, right. so. You mentioned a little bit about kind of what it's like being a reporter on the Hill. And I'm wondering for a lot of our maybe um, younger uh, listeners who might be interested in pursuing uh, journalism, how do you prepare for, I don't know, covering the Hill or, or something as fast paced as that? I think it depends on what, you know, what, what you're trying to cover. Um, it's one thing to cover kind of house leadership, but it's also something else to cover in a kind of an active investigation, especially like the January 6th committee, which ended up acting more and has it been ending up more like, a, I should say, because it hasn't finished yet. Um, like a, almost like a, like a criminal investigation as it's kind of, they were approaching as prosecutors would, um, with a little bit more leeway to talk about the investigation in a way that maybe the justice department cannot, especially for, you know, a grand jury investigation. Um, I think, you know, the, the, various kind of techniques for both i think um a lot of it is though trying to get into the mindset of the people working uh whether it's whether you know they're working in the, the speaker's office or if they're working as a kind of investigative council i always thought it's not enough just to be reactive to the news like if, if there's a press release that comes out and says you know donald trump has has defied 
the select committee subpoena, yeah, you can do a story about that. But I was sort of much more interesting to report beforehand and being like, you know, what is Donald Trump thinking and how is he going to respond to the subpoena? Because the way he, you know, plays his plays his game is going to be important to how things develop. And if you if you can have an insight into where things are going, I think it gives you uh, an insight into the overall investigation and um, kind of the the potential outcomes. That's interesting. And then for in terms of career paths for for journalism, I mean, you're obviously now at um, a pretty reputable outlet, um, The Guardian. For those who maybe just graduated college, how common is it to go straight to maybe like a national publication? Or do you think the traditional model of journalism where you start at a local local outlet and then you work your way up still applies? Yeah, I think that I think that that has changed. I think, you know, even five, 10 years ago, you had to go through that that local route you had to go you know you had to intern our local paper and, and then or if you're in kind of local tv you had to serve like you know local affiliate stations and then end up that kind of national outlet i don't think that's the way it works anymore um especially because i think student reporting and st- student journalism at, at colleges has become so powerful um i think you know a lot of it's about to me at least a lot of it's about the work product you know if you can file good copy and you can kind of shed light onto things that I don't know maybe you know piss you off personally then those are kind of the qualities that I think make you know for good reporters it's really a people it's really a people game um and you know Victor and I you know we've talked about this before about how the like the best skills you could have as a journalist really aren't the kind of things you I think you learn in like you know if you take a journalism degree you know sure you can take a graduate you know journalism course and you know that has its benefits but I think interacting with people you know learning how people tick um how to elicit information from them that they don't otherwise want to share that's really what journalism is about right it's about trying to shed light on things that that would otherwise remain hidden um and so i think if you can deliver the work product and kind of file clean copy as we say in the industry um that's really what makes you stand out and if you can demonstrate that to an editor i think that kind of bolsters your uh, your chances yeah, and of course, I, I am a journalism undergrad um, who learned to write in journal school and then learned to think and how to question people in law school, but right. ho- hopefully didn't ruin my ability to write a plain <laughs> sentence. Okay. And here comes Frisbee. Oh, God. There's Sorry always about that. one moment. There's always a moment for him to join the crowd. Okay, please sit down and be quiet, Frisbee. Good boy. So... Um, Let's move to the reason that you're in Palm Beach right now, which is the expected announcement from Donald Trump uh, in a matter of hours now. Uh, Tell us what you know about the timing and what you expect the announcement to be and whether he's listened to any of the Republicans who are saying, please do not announce your candidacy until after the Georgia uh, runoff. Look, I, th- I think, you know, 95% of this, this announcement's happening. Um, and it's been like that for a few days now. Um, I think it's without a doubt that, that Trump is in his most politically vulnerable state that he's been in probably since, since um, January 6th, um, especially with the results of the midterms, which were objectively yeah. underwhelming, including four candidates that he endorsed. I mean, people yeah. like, you know, Mehmet Oz, um, Carrie Lake. You know, he had a bright spot with, with J.D. Vance in Ohio, but that was really his, his kind of his, his, his peak. Um, there were a bunch of candidates that he really got behind that, that were pretty soundly defeated. And there was certainly a chorus of external advisors, I would characterize them. You know, there weren't people who had formal roles with kind of MAGA Inc. or the Save America PAC as, you know, political action committees who were telling him, look, uh, we really think you should delay your announcement until after the Senate runoffs in Georgia. And I think front of mind for them was, you know, back in 2020, when we had Senate runoffs in Georgia, um, you know, Trump ended up voicing his own personal grievances at rallies about the 2020 election. And that seemed to uh, kind of hamper Republicans um, kind of uh, prospects in that election. And, and of course, you know, Democrats ended up taking the Senate. Um but that was, I mean, those advisors who were advising a delay really, really lost this battle. The people around him who he was really listening to and who he ended up um, uh, siding with were his top political team. You know, people like David Bossie, people like Dave, um, Boris Epstein, the in-house counsel. 
um, people like uh, Taylor Budowicz, who's the executive director at MAGA Inc. Um, they were all telling him, look, you have to go with this announcement. We've now teased it. If you delay, it will make you seem weak and it will make you seem like you're politically wounded by the results. And that's probably going to be bad. And actually, they, they ran him through, a, from what I understand, a couple of scenarios like, look, if you actually, let's say you delayed your announcement until after the runoff. If Herschel Walker, the Republican candidate, loses, then you're in exactly the same place, if not worse. If you just go now and he loses, well, nothing changes. So you have no, you have no downside to announcing yeah. now. It doesn't, it doesn't make any difference. So you should just do it now. You're going to get a full week's coverage. And also the other thing is like with the calendar, they were thinking if, you, if Trump waited until after the runoffs, we would probably only get three or four days coverage before we're in the holiday season. Um, mm -hmm. And then, you know, we're in Christmas and the new year and then his, his announcement would have been muted. So I think that was like, there was a co coverage aspect to this as well. Let me just ask you, you mentioned Herschel Walker, and I heard something today that was quite disturbing, which is that Herschel Walker um, has complained that Donald Trump was allegedly raising money for him, but that in fact, 90% of the money raised was going to Donald Trump and only 10% was going to Herschel Walker. And that because Walker went public with that, He's now redistributing it as, I think, 50-50 or 60-40, but I think 50-50. Um, can you enlighten me about that at all? Yeah, I don't think anyone should be surprised by that. I mean, this is, <laughs> this is what Trump has done for, for a long time. Um, and there's nothing that says he can't do it. It's not illegal, right? I mean, this is how these kind of, this is how um, Act Red, you know, the, the, the Republican fundraising platform operates. You know, Trump has always... Um, campaigned on his on his name and used his brand, um, even under the guise of um, you know helping other candidates. And because he's giving you know those ten cents of every dollar to, for instance, the Walker campaign, kind of he he manages to kind of stay between the lines. I think, but this should come as no surprise to anyone. I mean, this has been his modus operandi for a for a long time, where he he rakes in a lot of the money. And you know, Save America PAC is sitting on a really big uh, cash dump. Um, and really, he only spent a, a, a small amount of that during the midterms. I mean, it wasn't an insignificant spend, but MAGA Inc., the political action committee set up to funnel some of that money from his main leadership pack, Save America. It was only about 15 to 20 million overall. Um, Save America pack is, is millions, millions, tens of millions more. Um, and so I think, um, you know, if, if anything was an indication that Trump intends to run, that, 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 is, that is that, right? He's trying to build up his own chest. And not being surprised doesn't mean it's not disgusting, yeah. that it's not clearly spelled out that you are not contributing to the Walker campaign except 10 cents on the dollar. And that's where the issue comes in. It's, it's not that he can't do it. He can. It's just that I think people are deceived uh, and it's a bad idea and that the campaign laws should be much clearer about how you have to make clear in a request what percentage is going to which part of the uh, donee. I mean, it's just what grifters do, I guess. I, I have one question uh, for you, Hugo, which is the, around the particular timing of this announcement. Um, uh, last week, we were both at dinner and we found out that Trump teased this announcement of an announcement uh, at a rally in Ohio. Um, and that rally in Ohio was a day after basically Ron DeSantis released this ad when, uh, I guess, where basically God uh, called on Ron DeSantis to be governor. Uh, I'm wondering, do you know if that had any impact on his decision to make this announcement? Yeah, I think I think it, it probably factored a little bit into his decision. It's not always clear kind of what drives Trump. You know, Trump, Trump has wanting, been wanting to announce his 2024 campaign for, for some time now. He actually wanted to announce in the summer. He got talked out of it uh, by various people, including Kellyanne Conway, who, uh, who is slated to have a role on the campaign yeah. now. Um, mm. And, you know, they basically got him to hold off until, you know, after the midterms. But you know, case in point with this Ohio rally, you know, Trump really, really wanted to go with this announcement at the J.D. Vance rally when he was stumping for J.D. Vance. He really wanted to announce it. And again, this was with this classic case of kind of Republican operatives and kind of more, you know, kind of national Republican allies getting into his ear and saying, look, you know, we don't want you to announce, um, which meant he effectively had to chart a compromise because he didn't want to lose out either. And so what he ended up doing is announcing an announcement and it kind of helped no one, including himself. Mm. Um, and in, in fact, it, was, it probably had the same effect as if he had announced it, at least in terms of potential you know, democratic turnout, for instance, in the, in the, in the election. 
have you talked to anyone on the hill? What is the mood there? Yeah, look, the, the hill's a different beast, right? I mean, you know, McCarthy and McConnell in the House and Senate have very diff different approaches to Trump. You know, McConnell has decided uh, a long time ago that he's just going to wash his hands of Trump. Um, and that has been his, 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 his way ever since. It's actually a quite an interesting um, uh, kind of story about uh, McConnell and Trump recently with the midterms about how when the Herschel Walker, when the Daily Beast reported uh, about Herschel Walker paying for abortions, um, MAGA Inc. thought twice about continuing to support him and continuing to, to kind of pay for ads for Walker. And it was only because McConnell decided that his um, his campaign arm, uh, kind of uh, Senate Leadership Fund, would continue paying um, uh, uh, for for Walker's ads. That MAGA Inc. jumped back in. Um, you know, McConnell is a very astute political operator. He's been around for so long. In fact, he you know for a long time people talked talked about him as the most powerful when he was in the majority Senate majority leader um, because of his kind of his power in the Senate. Um, you know, but then on the other hand, you have McCarthy in the House, who's been very willing, especially after January 6th, to go and kind of kiss the ring, as it were, and um, and try and appease Trump. And so yeah, I think you've got two diverging factors, you know, and there's in each of their own reporting conferences in the House and Senate, they're, kind of, they're varying degrees of criticism to how each leader has, has proceeded. I think it's a really interesting interplay. I don't think we've seen the, the last of it. I mean, for instance, today, McCarthy... Um, you know, won his internal kind of leadership nomination as it were inside the Republican conference, but he only got 188 votes. He has to get the 218 on January 3rd if he wants to be right. speaker. So um, I think, you know, he's got some work to do and whether or not he decides to appease, let's say, the, the, the Freedom Caucus uh, or, you know, appease different different elements in, in the conference who are aligned to Trump or aligned to other people. And, um, you know, certainly Trump has a lot of sway over the hill that I think people don't always appreciate. So I don't know if you agree with me, but I do not think that his announcement, assuming it is what we're expecting, that he's going to be a candidate, will have any impact on the Department of Justice or any other investigation of Trump. But it will have an impact on whether or not the RNC can continue to fund his legal fees and other expenses. And I'm just wondering if that doesn't play a role in whether he officially announces or whether he can skirt it in some way. What do you think? I don't think so. I think, look, I agree with you on the first point. Um, certainly people around Trump think if he is the candidate that he might have some insulation from the, from the Justice Department. Mm -hmm. I think that's really misguided. I mean, this department led by, you know, A.G. Garland and, and the DAG, uh, Lisa Monaco, they're, they've really shown... Um, and talked about how they are prepared to prosecute anyone, whether it's January 6th or with the documents investigation, yeah. so long as they have the evidence sufficient to kind of to prove the case. Um, and I don't think, and, and certainly it would be, a, it would be an, a, a really bad precedent for the department to you know, think twice about prosecuting someone because they're running for office. <laughs> I mean, that would, that would open the door to kind of, uh, that, that would just be a terrible precedent for the Justice Department to set. Yes. Um, so I don't think there's any there's any kind of idea in the Justice Department that they're gonna they're even gonna consider that. Um, as for the second point with the funding his lawyers, I don't think he's that concerned about who ends up funding the lawyers. He's already starting to pay a lot for his legal team. Um, I think he thinks it's a small price to pay if uh, if because in his mind, you know, announcing announcing his candidacy means he's protected. Um, so I don't think he minds paying for lawyers. In fact, because he's already started doing so. So let's move on to January 6th, um, which I think that's actually uh, the first time that I actually met you, uh, Hugo, right outside of the uh, hearing room. Uh, you've covered so much about this committee and, and its ins and outs um, from the violence on January 6th to the fake electors, uh, pressure on Mike Pence and state legislatures and more. Uh, I'm wondering, what does the future of the committee look like with the results of uh, the midterm elections? It seems like um, Republicans are barely going to hold on to control of the House does that change uh, this investigation? Uh, not really. Look, I, look, this investigation was always going to come to an end at the end of this Congress because that's how select committees work. Um, they expire at the end of, you know, and, and their subpoenas and their, you know, contemporary for instance, expire at the end of each Congress. And 
if you already see the composition of the select committee, you know, Liz Cheney is not going to be in Congress in the next in the next Congress, nor is Adam Kinzinger, nor is uh, Stephanie Murphy, who's retired. Um, and so this committee was always going to end um, at the end of this Congress. I don't think it changes the investigative work at all. You know, they're still doing their investigative work. They're still working on now they're working on their final report. Um, I don't, I, yeah, look, I don't think it makes any difference. They were always going to complete their work and regard, you know, whoever ends up taking control of Congress, it seems to be Republicans uh, in January is, is not going to affect the, the, the final work product of the committee. And do you hearing before the new Congress, or if not another hearing, um, will there be a final report? Yeah, look, I think uh, we should expect a final report probably probably after the, the Senate runoffs is, is my guess. It, you know, nothing is ever final with this committee, especially because it's Congress and it you know, moves to its own tune. Um, but I think, you know, we should expect a final report early December. There may be a hearing around the release of that report. Uh, maybe they'll do a hearing about potential recommendations or changes to legislation. Um, but I think, you know, the bulk of the work is, has, has to come to an end. I think there are various avenues that the committee never got to pursue. Um, and I think those will be raised in the, 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 the final report as well. You know, the things that they thought they might have leads on, if only they had more time, if only they had more investigative power. But at the end of the day, I think the committee has done a very, very good job of, you know, bringing to light to the American public just the sheer sprawling nature of Trump's attempt to undermine democracy and to effectively, um, you know, stop the certification on January 6th and to basically overturn the results of the 2020 election. I think it really brought home to the country just how brazen it was and just how he was involved personally. And before we move to another subject, I want to just a, a couple of questions. One is the possibility that the Senate, which will be uh, in democratic control, if they could take over during Watergate, the investigation was done by a Senate select committee uh, led by Senator Irvin, and they did a very good job and they particularly focused on what laws needed to be passed, which is one of the things that the report seems to be skipping over. Um, it sounds like they're going to focus on pointing the evidence to uh, and linking it to Donald Trump specifically. And, and when I say January 6th and the January 6th committee, I, I, I like the fact that it was much broader than just the violence of the insurrection on January 6th, that it was all of the other parts of the plan to subvert our democracy and to overturn the election results. And those things, uh, the role of what could have been done by the FBI, the CIA, uh, Homeland Security, the Capitol Police, uh, all of those things seem to me are still in need of investigation. So that part at least could be transferred to the Senate, don't you think? Yeah, I think it's a, I think it's an open question. I think um, the select committee is going to have to decide how it wants its work product to move forward, right? I mean, for the basically the entire life of this investigation, we've been talking about whether you know they would submit a, for instance, a referral to the Justice Department. You know, now there doesn't seem to be a need for a referral because the Justice Department seems to already be investigating a number of kind of the the efforts to overturn the election, whether it was with the fake elector scheme or with the January 6th rally organizers or, you know, the actual, you know, far-right extremist groups like the Proud Boys and the Earth Groups that actually stormed the Capitol. Um, but this is a question that they're going to have to decide what they want to do uh, about. Um, I think a Senate, a, you know, transferring the work product to the Senate is a, a potential avenue for them. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, it's also politics. And the House is very kind of, sees itself as you know as its own organization and it sees the senate as like a separate entity and i wonder if there is um an appetite to let the senate carry on their work um i think it's a, i think it's an open question that hasn't been decided yet it's an interesting one that i think we victor and i will certainly be following i'm sure you will too but let's let's talk since you're near mar-a-lago Let's talk about Mar-a-Lago and where that case is right now. Um, do you think there's going to be a indictment soon? Do you think there will ever be an indictment? What is your feeling on um, on that? 
I mean, you're reporting even this weekend that Trump retained documents bearing classification markings along with communications from uh, after his presidency. And what what is the significance of what's going on there and the risk to our democracy, to our security, to our national security? No, I thought the story we did this weekend was really important because, um, and it came at the same time as another very important story uh, about about Trump kind of potentially misusing his power, using the IRS to kind of um, uh, audit basically his political enemies. Um, but I thought it was important because it starts to kind of, you kind of start to see the contours of a potential case here, right? Um, and, and we should just take a step back and say, for the Mar-a-Lago documents investigation, the Justice Department really seems to be considering whether to build a trial team. You know, we have the addition of two real veteran um, trial attorneys um, to this investigation. You have um, David Rohde detailed to the criminal division, main justice, and then we also have the addition of David Raskin, a kind of a veteran kind of counterterrorism prosecutor, um, help out on this investigation. That seems to be a real indication that the department is you know, strongly considering whether they should uh, bring a prosecution. But there have been a number of developments uh, that I think are significant. The first, of course, was the reporting we did this weekend, which was, you know, Trump in his death drawer at Mar-a-Lago had these cat documents commingled with communications that are post-dated after his presidency. That would seem to suggest that Trump certainly had access or was handling or um, was kind of involved with these classified documents when he was no longer president, when he no longer had the authorization to be handling these documents. And I think that that could speak to a potential uh, charge kind of under the Espionage Act, you know, um, 18 U.S.C. 793. Um, but then there were also other developments in the other strands of the investigation, right? For instance, with the obstruction part, um, they recently gave, or well, the Justice Department gave uh, limited immunity to Cash Patel, one of Trump's top advisors and confidants, who uh, was basically forced to tell a uh, federal grand jury in Washington um, about whether these documents at Mar-a-Lago were indeed declassified as Trump has claimed they were. Uh, and, you know, that seems to speak to a potential obstruction case. So there have been a lot of developments under the surface, which taken as a whole could be significant. I do want to point out to our audience that whether they are classified or not classified is irrelevant to all of the crimes that were listed in the search warrant. They do not have to be classified to be violations of those laws. The fact that they may have been still classified and are of highly uh, dangerous content for our national security raises the ante on it. It raises the possibility of additional crimes, but there are still crimes even if there is some evidence that he declassified them, which so far there isn't. And the use immunity to Cash Patel uh, we still don't know what he said, so it's going to be right. interesting to await that. Uh, that's going to and, be. And really I should just clar- I should just clarify on on Cash Patel. You know, it sounds like certainly we don't know what he said, but in terms of the questioning, it seems like the kind of federal prosecutors were trying to see if if Trump and Cash came up with the declassification reason as almost like an excuse for why these documents weren't returned, and that seem to speak more to the obstruction side. I don't know if you agree, Joe, uh, but it seems to just, um, speak hmm. more to the obstruction side. Um, but uh, I think uh, the jury is out on that. You may be right, but I would say that it is an ineffective defense at best, that taking right, right. documents no, we, we that belong to the government the is still taking documents that belong to the government. And whether they are just presidential records, which are not of national security interests, or whether they are classified national security documents, they're still not his, and he had no right to retain them for any reason. So it sort of doesn't matter. Um, The obstruction is lying about them and saying, I don't have them, I've given you them all, um, and while at the same time moving them from place to place. So I I think there are two different things going on here, but no particular um, valid or effective defense. So let's wrap by um, 
kind of looking ahead into uh, all the other investigations. So like we said at the outset, there is uh, the civil and criminal investigation in New York. There's a Georgia, there's Eugene Carroll. What do you think uh, our audience should look to uh, in the kind of, kind of weeks and months ahead? What is uh, kind of one that you're paying close attention to? Yeah, I mean, look, most immediately, I think the, the Fulton County investigation um, is, is probably the, the one we should keep an eye on. It seems very likely, based on what Fannie Willis, the district attorney in Georgia, is saying, that there will be indictments there. Um, whether or not that touches Trump you know, remains to be seen. But it, sound, it sounds like you know, Fannie Willis was kind of waiting for the midterms to be over. Uh, and then she's kind of and she has said previously that she was she was examining whether she would bring charges as early as December. Um, so I think that's the, 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 the thing to watch for now. And and as, as you know, maybe that opens the door for other charges down the line, for instance, um, by the DOJ in the, in the fake elective scheme. Um, so I think that's what I what I'm keeping my my eye on the most. But also, you know, this Mar-a-Lago investigation. No. Oh. A lot of it's been behind closed doors because it's 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 grand jury and it's all secret. Um, but there have been a lot of indications recently that DOJ is taking a very aggressive posture on this. And you know, as Jill says, you know, I think the elements of the crime are all there. You know, he was not supposed to have these documents, but he was not. He, I mean, these are unauthorized. This was the unauthorized retention of national security information at his beachfront resort. It's a very clear, the crime is keeping them, right? So when he had right. them and then when he basically did not comply with a subpoena demanding their return, I mean, that in itself is the crime. So it seems pretty straightforward. Um, and, it's, and, I, and I wonder if DOJ is just waiting for this, um, this special mass litigation, the tangential special mass litigation um, to be completed and for them to get the unclassified documents so they can just do a thorough review of all of the documents before they proceed with uh, potential charges. Well, all eyes will definitely be on Georgia and Mar-a-Lago. And um, Hugo, thank you so much for joining us and uh, walking us through all things Trump. And I hope our audience will be having their eyes on you and your reporting because yes. you've been doing a great job. We thank you for being with us today and for all that you're doing for getting the facts out. Thank you. No, thank you both. This has been really fun. Thank you. So, Jill, we have uh, so much to discuss, and and I think we should do a separate episode where maybe we just talk about some of the news of the day, because there is so much. But um, just in terms of today, I, I know I called you a little bit uh, before this episode. Uh, I think it's just worth kind of telling our audience that there has been this incident uh, in Poland where uh, Russia basically um, sent a missile uh, aimed at Ukraine, but it went to Poland or struck Poland instead. So far, there is about two people dead um, and uh, the White House hasn't confirmed this yet, but the Pentagon is uh, kind of going through the assessments. And uh, it's just there's so much going on with the midterms, with this, with Trump. Um, so and as I said to you, it was almost inevitable. Yeah. But yeah. I, I think we shouldn't overlook the fact that the bombs were aimed at civilians, that they have dropped bombs in Kiev, that it's not just in military targets, but it's yep. the yep. infrastructure is being destroyed to hurt the civilian population and that civilian targets, civilian buildings are being targeted. Right. And so this is really getting to a point where um, it's going to change how international yeah. relations uh, exist. And it's, it's horrible. I mean, it's mm -hmm. really sad that anybody is, any civilians are ever killed. It's oh. sad that a country can start a war with no cause. Um, and so we'll be following that for sure. Yeah. And there's also potential uh, violations of NATO Article 5. Um, so we'll, we'll definitely have those conversations in the days and weeks to come, because I think it's an important uh, development and scary development for, uh, like you said, broader international yes. relations. Um, well, maybe let's talk about some good news. I mean, the last time we convened was before the election, which seemed like years ago. Um, you know that I've been particularly uh, um, kind of optimistic about the youth vote, and I've definitely been uh, happy about where young people turn out to vote and thought that was good news. But what have you thought uh, has been good news for the in the past week? Well, just yesterday, Katie Hobbs was elected yes. to be governor. And that's really important because the legislature of yep. Arizona is quite conservative and will pass, not would have, they will 
pass really restrictive laws and she will be able to veto them. So that's really important. I think the fact that so many election deniers yep. lost is really big news and really good news. We had Giselle Fetterman on yep. our show and we, we both adored her and thought she was really a remarkable person in her own right. And so we mm -hmm. were, of mm -hmm. course, closely watching that race and are happy with the results of that. Um, I think there's a lot to continue to watch, including the fake news, including the fake newspaper, actual thing that purports to be a newspaper, but that was campaign propaganda published by a Republican rich person yeah. uh, with all sorts of fake news about our governor in Illinois, yours yeah. and my governor, uh, Pritzker, who's been doing a great job, yep. but was being yep. attacked for totally things that had nothing to do with him mm -hmm. and that were just made up. So I, I think there's a lot that we have accomplished. We can all breathe a sigh of relief. Yeah. And remember, I was following Michael Moore and saying, I choose to not be tense before the election because it won't do me any good. I can worry and act after if the worst happens. But see, I saved myself all that yes, yes. because I didn't need to be worried. We, yep. we prevailed. And it's still possible, unlikely, but still possible that the House will turn Democratic. But in any event, it's going to be a really split caucus for the yep. Republicans and with a very narrow margin. Um, I also want to mention that I learned something this week. I, I don't think I ever really knew this, that with a 50-50 Congress, and so this is why it's really important, young voters, old voters in Georgia, you must go out and vote because if it's 51 to 49, then the Democrats don't have to have an equal number of members on each committee. And then they don't need oh. a Republican vote to get things out of committee. Right now with a 50-50, right. there's an equal number and they cannot get things, Democrats could not get things out of committee. Oh. without some Republican support. So if you thought it doesn't matter anymore because we have a 50-50 with, with, of course, the vice president being the 51st vote to break a tie, no, that isn't how it works. We yeah. need the first senator. It's really important. It also gives us a little leeway in the case of cinema or mansion uh, not staying with the Democratic Party. So please, everyone... The vote, the the runoff is soon. You must get out there and vote. I agree. And you mentioned something about um, the state legislatures, and those are so important. We also had on um, Mallory McMorrow, who is a fierce advocate for why state legislatures are so important. And Michigan was actually one of the states that flipped its state legislature for yes. the first time since the 1980s. So that's really good news. And you saw a lot of states flip their legislatures from Republican to Democrat. You have a lot of states that are now trifectas, where um, basically the House, the Senate, and the governorship are all uh, Democratic. And so those are going to be really key states against the backdrop of states like Florida and uh, other Republican states that try to kind of enact more harsher uh, um, laws for people. And so I think those are going to be states that we're going to be paying close attention to. And like you said, for Georgia, it's going to be all hands on deck. Um, Georgia is a unique state in the sense that um, more than 20% of voters are beneath the age of 30. And the majority of voters are women. And so um, for women, for young voters, that's going to be a key election. And I think it's worth noting for Georgia, too, that if you didn't register to vote before November 8th, you can't vote in this election. Um, so as long as you voted before then, you have to turn out to vote. This is going to be all about turnout uh, for de December 6th. So um, we will definitely be keeping a close eye on that and having many conversations about that race because it's so important. Um, but in the meantime, you can subscribe to us wherever you follow your podcasts. We will be here next week with another episode of iGen Politics on YouTube. So be sure to subscribe to Politicon on YouTube and be sure to hit the bell for a weekly notification so you don't miss an episode of iGen Politics. Thank you so much for watching or listening to this episode, and we'll see you next week for another episode of iGen Politics.